you as a congregation, this is a woman who hears from the Lord and then articulates it and brings it in a way that is understandable, digestible, to use her language, digestible. And if you are, are um, not as sincere about listening to the word of God when she preaches, I want to encourage you, do what Jesus said. He who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says. So you need to be proud of your pastor. She's not paying me to say this. She's not promised me Skittles. I promise there's no, there's no byproduct of this. Um, but she really did a fabulous job and not just kept up with the other guys, but it was just, it really was tremendous. I've had one of those weeks. Yeah, Mark's back there going, yeah, amen. <laughs> I've had one of those weeks where, um, because of retreat, I got to listen to um, a lot of preaching, and that has filled my soul this week. And then yesterday, I spent um, a full afternoon, a full day, pretty much, uh, listening to more preaching at a different meeting that I was at. And I'm just full of the Lord's goodness today, and um, I just really appreciate um, the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives that happens every day, day in, day out. Some days we experience it. Maybe we feel like we experience it more, it's more tangible or something, but man, I'm just full today. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I did watch last week's sermon, and I, again, I'm not saying this just because Renee is here, Pastor Renee is here. If you did not see it, or if you've forgotten what she taught about last week, I would strongly encourage you to go back and watch that video, watch that sermon, listen to that sermon. Because it was all about the brokenness of people. And we are all people in this room and online, and we are all broken. And the message just very clearly explained how Jesus comes to heal the brokenhearted, to bind up the wounds of people. And if I were to ask you who has wounds in this room, all of us, if we're going to be honest, would have to raise our hand. And none of us really want to talk about it publicly. <laughs> But you'll share it with the Lord, you'll share it with close friends or family, etc. So it really was a great part one to what I want to talk about today. The sermon last week is about Jesus coming into your life and healing your life and setting you free from your captivity of sin, whether it looks like addiction, whether it looks like whatever, it's still a, you're captive to sin. So I was talking with a guy this morning at, at to faith before I came down. And he's had some real struggles in his life. And um, the Holy Spirit has just delivered him. Like completely delivered him. And you can see it in his face. You can see it in his eyes. You can hear it in his voice. You hear about his day, how his day is moving forward. And, and it's just so fun. And I said, you know, Jesus talks about being the one who sets captives free. And he has set you free from this. And he just looked at me and got a tear in his eye. Like, I'm just so grateful. So part one was last week. Part two, unbeknownst to all of you, is this week. And again, I just want to encourage you to take advantage of the sermon from last week. I want to talk this morning, um, if I may, out of Mark chapter four. And you've got some lesson notes in your um, bulletins, and you can certainly refer to those. Um, I'm going to read the text, and then we're just going to go through and kind of parse it, take it apart a little by little. It's a familiar story that most of you, if you spent much time in church, uh, you probably have heard this. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation today. The first 20 verses of Mark chapter 4 says, Once again, Jesus began teaching by the lakeside, lake shore. A very large crowd soon gathered around him, so he got into a boat. Then he sat in the boat while all the people remained on the shore. He taught them by telling many stories in the form of parables, such as this one. Let me just set the context. Jesus has a crowd who's coming to see him and hear him. And the crowd is so big, it's not like us in this room where I could turn the microphone off and you could just hear me. It's a crowd that's so vast that Jesus has to get into a boat and they push him out a little ways. And then because he's able then to disperse, his, his voice is able to, to carry the reflection off the water, etc. He's able to teach this large crowd of people. And the first thing that he says, according to Mark chapter four, verse three is, listen up. It's kind of one of those stick your fingers in your mouth and go moments. Like, I'm not just talking. I'm not just spinning my wheels, spinning my wheels here, just wasting time. 
Like, listen, this is really important. So verse three, listen, a farmer went out to plant some seed as he scattered across his field. Some of the seed fell on a footpath and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on the shallow soil with underlying rock. The seed sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow, but the plant soon wilted under the hot sun. And since it didn't have deep roots, it died. Other seed fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants, so they produced no grain. Verse 8, still other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they sprouted, grew, and produced a crop that was 30, 60, even a 100 times as much had been planted. Then he said, anyone who has ears to hear should listen and understand. Later, when Jesus was alone with the 12 disciples and others who had gathered around him, they asked him what the parables meant. Skipping down now to verse 13. Then Jesus said to them, if you can't understand the meaning of this parable, how will you understand all the parables, all the other parables? The farmer plants seed by taking God's word to others. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message only to have Satan come at once and take it away. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy, but since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fail, I'm sorry, they fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. Verse 18, the seed that fell among the thorns represents those who others who hear God's word, but all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of this life the lure of wealth, and the desire for other things. So, no fruit is produced. And the seed that fell on the good soil represents those who hear and accept God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as had been planted. There are two very important symbols in this story. And if you understand the symbols in the story, you understand the parable. Jesus, his favorite method of kind of formalized teaching was in the form of parables. And parables, by their design and definition, are crafted this way. They're always fictitious. They're always make-believe. So what Jesus is telling here is not a story of fact, but of fiction. So understand that parables are always a fictional story, such as a man has two sons. The younger son came to his father and said to his father, I can't wait until you're dead. I want my share of the inheritance now. Luke 15, the parable of the lost son. That's a fictitious story. But here's the other part of it. These fictitious stories are always intended to have the bigger meaning hidden to send people away wondering, mm -hmm. pondering, stewing on that. And we see that in this story in Mark chapter uh, four today, where the disciples hear this parable story and later when they get Jesus alone, because they didn't want to say anything in front of, you know, the large crowd, like, we don't get it. Mm -hmm. like, we're supposed to be the inner circle. So they wait till he's alone, with Je they're alone with Jesus and they say, I don't get it. Help us understand this. They've been stewing on this. They've been wondering. They've been pondering in their heart and their mind, what does this parable mean? And then Jesus explains it. So understanding that about parables helps us understand parables just in, in general terms. They are fictitious and they are always designed not to be self-evident but so that the hearer, the listener, will walk away pondering and wondering and ruminating on that over and over and over again. The first symbol in this story is the seed. The seed represents God's kingdom. It is his word for all people. It is the gospel story. It is the Christmas story. It is the communion story. It is those moments when God's story impacts the life of a human being and something 
should happen. That's what the seed represents in this story. The seed is not the central focus in the story. The soil is the central focus. The farmer is not the central focus. The soil is the central focus of this fictitious, made-up story that hopefully today will send you away wondering, pondering. So we understand the seed is God's kingdom in that moment when it intersects with the human life. Symbol number two, the soil. And the soil represents how people interact or receive or embrace the seed that has been cast into their life. Like what happens next? It is how people take this into their heart. Because the seed is cast, but the soil doesn't receive in some cases. So what does this look like? In our, in our understanding, first of all, it's a perfect time to preach this message because from October until December, this is planting season in Galilee. This is when they would have been doing this, planting seeds. And in the story, the farmer would have had a big bag, a big satchel on. I'm left-handed, so it'll be on my right-hand side. The big bag is full of seed. And the farmer would reach into this, the bag and toss the seed, much like we might throw a Frisbee in our, our world, right? This was totally pre-mechanization of anything. So it's manual labor to the nth degree. So if you're a farmer and you're farming an acre or 10 or hundreds, I don't know how big farms were back then, but can you imagine doing this for however many hours a day it takes you to plant? So the seed is cast, the kingdom of God has gone forth, and some of that seed the very first soil we see in the parable is called a footpath. It is unresponsive, verse 15. It's unresponsive. It's so, so well trodden, so well compacted that when the seed hits it, the seed doesn't get down into the soil. And as Jesus explains, birds come in and go, oh, lunchtime, boom, and they grab it before the seed ever has time to do anything. This, this footpath, if you think of, of acreage, so we've got good soil in the middle. Next, we're going to talk, well, not next, next, but on the next side up is the thorny stuff. And then beyond that is the shallow, rocky stuff. And beyond that is the part where, like, in our world, you drive your tractor. In their world, you'd walk the field. This was the footpath. This wasn't you were trampling down the good soil, and you didn't want to walk amongst the thorns and you didn't care to, to fight all the rocks, so you made this footpath that you could walk on. And the first soil Jesus talks about is very unresponsive to this kingdom of God message. And some people, he says, they hear the proclamation of God's love for them, and it's just like Satan swoops in and just steals it. It doesn't have any Impact. It doesn't even it doesn't have a chance to grow because Satan just swoops in like a bird and just picks that thing off. I almost said sucker, but I don't want to do that in church. Picks that thing off. I guess I just did that, didn't I? The second type of you're listening, that's good. The second type of soil is shallow. It's unresponsive. See, they would have had to clear the good dirt, the, the, the good part of the land, so that when they're picking rocks up, they gotta put them somewhere. So they toss them to the side. So this is my this is the part of my farm. This is what I'm farming. I'm, I'm hoping to grow from. And to make that, to prepare that soil, I've got to clean it first from all the debris. So I'm taking that debris and I'm chucking it over here. And so now I've got this hard compact and then closer in is this rocky soil where it's really shallow. And Jesus says in the parable that sometimes that seed falls in that soil because you're doing this, right? You don't have a lot of control where it goes. And when the wind blows, it might blow it here and there. And sometimes that seed takes for a really short moment of time. It's what I call the impulsive people. They surrender their life to Christ and they burn hot and fiery for the first 15 minutes. 
or week or months or years but because they have no long-term commitment they have no perseverance they have no no um, idea to stick with it when the going gets tough it's like the little flower that shoots up in the morning and then in the heat of the day it just withers over and die because the roots don't go deep because the soil is too rocky it's too shallow and sadly, in my notes, you can't see this, but I have a, a name of a couple, a husband and wife, who this describes them. I first met the husband over the telephone because he had been released from state prison. We started doing Bible studies together. And then we got to meet face to face. And we walked through the journey of faith for several months and years together. And he and his wife put their marriage back together. And they were living life for the Lord until a few little things happened. And they got tired and they saw God more like a genie. And he wasn't doing what they asked. And so they just checked out of their faith. And my heart breaks when I see their name. Some of you may know others. You could tell that same kind of story. They're on fire for Jesus. The seed hit the soil and something started to produce and then the first little bit of and they just wither over and die. And it's so sad to watch. It's painfully sad to watch. The third type of soil is the thorny soil. The thorny soil, the, the kind of soil that I label as preoccupied, like the cares of this world have come into their life and it affects their faith just from memory. So I'm not even talking, I didn't do any internet research on this. Let me just read you some things that from my memory, I can tell you have happened and consumed our life's thoughts for the last two years. COVID-19. And all that happened because of that. For two weeks, we're gonna shut the system down and then we'll be able to open again. And we're 20 months into it. And this Delta variant came up and, and none of us on the globe, I'm not saying like in this room or in Stockton or in California or in the United States, none of us on this globe have been immune from COVID in one way or the other. It is a global pandemic hitting the rich and the poor, the young and the old, the English speakers and the Muslims, and the, and the, it, it is a global pandemic. And who has not thought about that once in the last 20 months? None of us, because it's here. And that's just the first thing. Then you want to talk about vaccinations. And are we going to get vaccinated? Yes, no, no, yes. I mean, it's, and it's divided families. I know of families who are split because of this injection in your arm. I'm not for it or again, I'm not, not telling you that. I just know that the concerns of this world have split apart families. And now we have inflation, which we have not experienced in America for some time. And the dollar doesn't go as far as it used to. And gas prices are up. And people are now complaining about $4.50 a gallon for gasoline when in Europe they've had four dollar and fifty cent per uh, liter for decades and uh, that's just a whole nother story but we're in America so we can complain <laughs> and there's a whole vast array of cargo ships sitting off the shores of Long Beach in LA today right now and if you don't do your Christmas shopping soon you may not get what you want you may not be able to buy what you want because it's in some shipping container sitting offshore in California, 400 miles away. And um, if you've been to any kind of retail store lately, you've probably seen a little sign that says this, due to the national coin shortage, pay with cash, exact change, or debit or credit card, please. And everybody who's anything in financial, personal financial counseling would say, pay with cash, don't use debit or credit. And yet because of this coin shortage, 
we are now being asked to pay with exact change. Oh, I'm not done, by the way. <laughs> China is surging. China is flexing its muscles. China wants to be the next great superpower and has developed a hypersonic missile that the experts say is five times faster than our fastest cruise missiles. And we have one president who was impeached twice and another one whose, whose political party has been in office since January, holds control of the House, the Senate, and the White House, and couldn't get his own agenda pushed through. That's like having a pastor, like Pastor Rene at the church, and the board and the congregation are all of the same mindset, and she floats one idea, and it doesn't go anywhere. It's like, oh, can we just do something productive? Even if it costs some money, can we do like something, please? And we have storms, and we have fires, and we have heat, and we have homelessness, and we have climate change, and then just the everyday run-of-the-mill crimes, and divorce, and disease, and addiction, and bankruptcy, and racial tensions. In Pastor Renee's sermon last week, she, she told the story of a six-year-old little boy whose father was killed as they were driving down a street in Stockton because the father and another guy got involved in a road rage, road rage incident. And you talk about the concerns of our world, I mean, it just so infiltrates our life. And Jesus says in this parable that there are some people when the kingdom of God comes into their life and it impacts their life, it's like it takes and it starts to grow and produce, but the cares of this world come and choke it out and kill the seed that was starting to plant and take deep root and starting to look like it's going to be productive. And that is what we're living in with the aftermath of COVID, this thorny soil because the cares of this world so press in on us. But the verse continues that not just the cares of this world, it's also the lure of wealth and the desire for other things so that no fruit is produced, the text says. And again, in my notes, I have a couple, a husband and wife, and it's just one example that this is their story. COVID has kept them away from church and fellowship, not just our church, but kept them away from church and fellowship for the last year and a half. And now the cares of this world have so impacted their lives, they're packing up and they're moving out of state because they just can't handle this anymore. And their faith is as weak as I've ever known their faith to be. This one for me, this thorny soil as it's called, man, this one, this one grabs my attention. Jesus says in this parable, and this is a sentence you might want to write down. Jesus says in this parable that becoming preoccupied with the world around us is an extremely dangerous thing to your faith. It is an extremely dangerous thing for your faith. It's like kryptonite to Superman. last several days in my heart and my mind this little refrain from a, a, an old church song written in 1922 has come to my mind my heart and the refrain says turn your eyes upon Jesus look full in his wonderful face and then the next line is this and this is the kicker and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. In, in a time, a season of our, our lives that is so impacted by the world stuff, and the other,
and more. I love kingdom, the gospel have to look like th this is good soil. have an advantage this is billion for the world to eat And when we see it, we go, nine, eight mile road. Good soil. The problem with the that does not fail. Seed does not fail. Twenty five And if you make widgets for a living, and when you're done making widgets and they go to quality assurance or quality control and they throw out seventy five percent of the widgets you make, would you feel like I'm a valued employee, I'm doing my job? And whatever your occupation, whatever, whatever context, if you're an attorney and 25% of your clients have a su successful outcome, but 75% end up in the worst possible scenario, would you be a good attorney? No. You'd feel like, man, I gotta start my own lawn mowing business or something. I'm sorry, pastors do that on Mondays. We, yeah. can, we have that thought on Mondays. <laughs> the math here is astounding. Because of the four different types of soil that are listed, from the footpath, to the rocky, shallow soil, to the, the thorny soil, to the good soil, 75% of the soil is bad soil. It's not going to last. Jesus is making the issue here, I think, that many, many more people will reject this gospel message than will actually embrace it. True, the Holy Spirit does the calling. Absolutely, the Holy Spirit does the calling. But we are farmers in the kingdom, and we are called to cast seed. We are called to cast seed. And understand this, that sometimes the seed we cast, it will have zero effect. And sometimes the seed we cast, we, the phone calls we make, the interaction we spend with people, the, the, the hours we might spend on the telephone or in person or at Starbucks, Panera, whatever, doing some kind of Bible study, helping them try to get rooted, sometimes that will take and then it will just wither away and die. And it's so disappointing when that happens. And other times you'll see people that you'll invest your life in, you'll cast seed to, and, and it'll sprout up and it'll start looking good. And it, it might, you might even go, this is going to reproduce. And then just life happens and they walk away. 
It can be really discouraging to be a farmer if you know that 75% of your efforts are going to fail. But keep casting the seed. Because sometimes that seed falls on good soil. And when that one seed falls on good soil, according to the math in this parable, it will produce 30, 60, or 100 fold which makes up for the 75% failure rate on the outside, doesn't it? Here's the lesson. The only way the farmer has to harvest more seed is this. Plant, I'm sorry, the only way the farmer has to harvest more crops is this, and that is to plant more seed. If you want to see more productivity in your life, you have to plant more seed. And so I just want to end today by acknowledging a couple of things. First of all, Paul, you know, the guy that we name our hospitals after and our popes after and our kids after, the one who has schools named after him, that Paul, the like St. Paul Paul, that guy, he experienced this. Here's what it says in Acts chapter 28, a couple of verses, 23 and 24. So a time was set, and on that day, a large number of people, so a big collection of people, came to Paul's lodging. He explained and testified about the kingdom of God, and here's what he was trying to do. And he tried to persuade them about Jesus from the scriptures. Using the law of Moses and the book of prophets, he spoke to them from morning until evening. Think about what's happening here. Paul has this reputation now as being Paul, he used to be Saul, now he's Paul. A big group of people start gathering where he's staying, and he preaches to them morning till night, trying to convince them who Jesus is and how he can change their life. And here's what it says in verse 24. Some were persuaded by these things, he said, but others did not believe. Paul experiences failure rate. If Jesus experienced it, and we know he did, if Paul experienced it, and we just read that he did, then you will experience this casting of seed moment where you try and try and try to farm the kingdom, and you will fail 75% of the time. It's just not going to land on good soil. It's not the fault of the seed. It's the fault of the soil. So I want to send you off with two questions that are designed, intentionally designed, to send you away pondering, wondering. The questions are this. As a sower of seed into God's kingdom, how was your harvest last year? Did you have a bumper crop? More than you can contain? Or was it a bust? As a sower of seed in God's kingdom, how was your harvest this past year? Second question is this. Will you sow more seed in the coming year? Will you sow more seed in the coming year? It is the mission of this church to know Jesus and make him known. To let the seed impact my heart and then to reach into the bag and cast the seed. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to bring your word. Thank you for the opportunity to be here to hear from you. So Holy Spirit, with, with what has been shared, I just pray that you will use it for your glory and for your kingdom, not just instructing our hearts, but as Pastor Rene reminded us earlier, to digest this, to take it in. Jesus, as you said in the parable itself, he who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. May we listen to you, be attentive to you, and may we cast more seed in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Kevin. Will you guys stand with me and let me pray a blessing over us and just reiterate what Pastor Kevin said. I pray that that seed this morning fell on good soil. I pray that you're able to kind of examine your own heart and where you're at in this. So if you want to just reach out and receive this blessing, 
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to each and every one of you. May the Lord turn his face toward you. And may the Lord give each and every one of you peace. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go and have a blessed week.